Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today on our fourth episode in the webinar series. Today's webinar is entitled The Role of Innovation in Building a More Food Secure Future. My name is Lenny Chiang and I am delighted to be your moderator today. I am a food science PhD student in the Faculty of Land and Food Systems. I study how various crops defend themselves against fungal diseases in the field. I've also worked in the food industry in BC and abroad. Now, before we begin, I would first like to acknowledge that UBC's Vancouver campus is situated on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Musqueam people. We would also like to acknowledge that all our participants today and audience members are joining us from many different places near and far, and acknowledge the traditional owners and caretakers of those lands. Now, today is the fourth installment in our webinar series entitled Building Resilient Food Systems During COVID-19 and Beyond. This series is brought to you by the Center for Sustainable Food Systems, the BC Food Web, and the Faculty of Land and Food Systems. The Center for Sustainable Food Systems at the UBC Farm is a teaching and research center, as well as a local to global food hub, working towards a more sustainable food secure future. Their mission is to innovate from field to fork to achieve resilient, thriving, and socially just food systems for all. BC Food Web is a web portal project which aims to increase access and connection to current research and other resource materials. In addition, it aims to encourage innovation between farmers and researchers for future project collaborations. The Faculty of Land and Food Systems is a world leader in integrated research, education, and service. The faculty aims to address critical global issues around human health and a sustainable food supply. Today's webinar is entitled, The Role of Innovation in Building a More Food Secure Future. I'm joined by Dr. Ricky Yada, Dr. Anubhav Pratap Singh, and Mr. Peter Dillon, who will be discussing how Canada can plan for a more food secure future and how it can ensure that we are able to withstand future pandemics. Now, a few housekeeping points before we continue. Each speaker will be given time for a brief presentation, after which we will all reconvene uh, for the Q&A portion of today's webinar. If you have any questions that you would like to ask, please submit them via the Q&A tab at the bottom of your Zoom control panel. From this window, you will also see the questions that other audience members have posed, and you are encouraged to upvote the ones that you would also like to see asked. In addition, if you would like the opportunity to chat with your fellow attendees, please head over to the facilitated audience discussion on the UBC Farms Facebook page, where this webinar is being streamed on Facebook Live. And lastly, the co-producers and I would like to acknowledge that these are unprecedented times, and that means that we are all working under new working conditions. Although we do not anticipate any distractions or interruptions today, we do ask for your patience should we run into any. So at this time, it is my pleasure to introduce our first speaker today. Professor Ricky Yada was appointed Dean of the Faculty of Land and Food Systems at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, BC in 2014. Prior to coming to UBC, Dr. Yada was at the University of Guelph, where he held numerous leadership roles, including Assistant Vice President Research, Canada Research Chair in Food Protein Structure, Scientific Director of the Advanced Foods and Materials Network within the, the networks of centers of excellence in Canada, and was a founding member of the Food Institute. He is currently the North American Editor of Trends in food science and technology, and serves on the editorial board of several journals. His areas of research include the structure function relationships of enzymes, specifically aspartic proteases, the carbohydrate biochemistry as related to nutrition and food quality. So with that, I would like to, I see Dr. Yara's already on the screen. Hello, thank you for joining us today. Thank you, you, Lenny. Yeah, and Dr. Yad, I was wondering if you could please share with us what your thoughts are around how COVID has impacted the agri-food system. Thank you, Lenny. Um, before I start, I hope everyone's safe and well during these unprecedented times um, and that, you know, you're surviving isolation. Um, as we come out of isolation, hopefully we'll get back to some sense of normalcy. Uh, I'm not sure what that normalcy will look like or the new normal will look like. But, you know, what have COVID has identified for me are some challenges. And I'm here today with two learned colleagues who are real content experts. So 
um, with the permission of Lenny and the audience, I think what I'll do is identify some of the challenges that I've seen as a result of COVID. And I think I'll preface it by saying that although we're into COVID, I would argue that this is probably the first of many challenges uh, that we're gonna see in the future. What it's really identified for me is what we don't have in place. And, and you know, it's really uh, precipitated us to become creative and innovative. And those are some of the things that Peter and Anu will talk about. But, you know, as we went into COVID, it was interesting to see panic buying, you know, whether that be, you know, some food items, uh, particularly baking items. Um, toilet paper uh, became a cherished item, you know. So for those of you who are familiar with Costco, you know, oftentimes you would have to line up to get into Costco as you would with a lot of the vendors. But you would go in there and you go, oh my God, there's no toilet paper, there's no flour, there's no baking goods. And I think this is precipitated by the fact that people were getting prepared for isolation. And the fact that there was this notion that people wouldn't be able to travel. And I'm gonna to return to that whole notion of travel because it impacted on other things, you know, that affected, you know, the agri-food system. And that was the supply chain. And so as we saw restaurants and hotels close, we saw this huge surplus of certain products. You know, for argument's sake, restaurants and hotels use those little creamers that we put in our coffee or tea. And there was no market for that, which created a surplus of milk. And I think some of you probably heard stories of dairies actually having to dump milk. And that factored into an issue that we're all near and dear to, food waste. There are so many people throughout the world who don't get enough food and healthy food. And we ended up actually pouring milk down the drain. You know, other commodities such as potatoes, you know, we planted these potatoes, but because restaurants and fast food chains were closed, there was no venue for French fries or baked potatoes. And so we've ended up with very expensive uh, fertilizer or animal feed. You know, so that's how transportation may have affected uh, this issue too of surpluses, because as we talked about, you know, supply chains being disrupted, Transportation systems also started to shut down. So even if we did have a market, we couldn't get the commodity to the vendor. Well, another issue, and I'm sure Anu will talk about this, is the agri-food system was relatively slow at being resilient. Um, we heard a lot about manufacturers being able to pivot quickly to produce PPE or hand sanitizer. But in the food industry, we didn't have that capacity. And so even if we did have that capacity, we may have been able to prevent some of these surpluses. So the innovative aspect, and I guess this is in the vein, Lenny, of with every challenge, there's probably an opportunity to look at innovative preservation technologies of the commodities that we harvest and grow, um, and also probably innovative processing technologies and products. And so Anu may touch upon these uh, areas, as does Peter, as will Peter. So if we have these creative young people who say, you know, I'm going to take a potato and make it into some other food product that doesn't require a lot of energy to produce it, then that's a good thing. And talking about food, I think, you know, what it also highlighted was the importance of local food supply. And again, as borders close and potentially borders close, you know, the whole notion of us being used to a global food supply system, you know, may be reduced. So things that we obtain from parts of the other world, whether that be South America or even the United States or Asia, we, not, we may not be able to get them into the country. 
And so again, it may cause some creativity uh, of products that we grow within uh, the country itself. Because I think what we need to do is be able to, and this is the food secure aspect, be able to reply, uh, you know, really uh, depend on the local foods that we grow and preserve them. And so in that vein, the chair of our faculty advisory board is a person by the name of Parm Baines, a large blueberry grower in the valley. And Parm was fortunate last year to put in some freezing facilities to freeze some of his blueberries. He told me without that capacity, and Peter, you'll probably talk about, you know, what do you do with, you know, the commodities that you grow? He was able to freeze them and actually prevent a loss of a, of a commodity that is near and dear to him. So that happened. You know, so the other issues that had come to light are the whole areas around zoonosis and, you know, this whole uh, theory about you know, did COVID start from an animal and get translated to a, or transferred to a human being, and then it became the global pandemic. You know, our uh, colleagues in the veterinary colleges are looking at that. So there's innovative research that is going on in that area. And then food safety, you know, with the closure of various manufacturing facilities, and I can think of abattoirs and, and for those of you in Canada who uh, are aware of the big uh, meat packing plants in Alberta they were closed because some of the workers were uh, infected and it became a infection site and then people were worried about the foods that were coming from those uh, abattoirs so that's another area of research that you know needs to be dealt and looked at even deeper. And so there's a number of issues that I think uh, have arisen out of COVID. And finally, I'll talk about labor. Um, you know, one of the things that I think people worry about, especially the pro processors, is will they be able to get enough even domestic workers into the plant because of concerns around safety? And uh, for those of you in Canada, again, who are listening, or watching this webinar, the whole issue of domestic workers and the inability or relative inability to get enough foreign workers into the country to help harvest commodities was a big issue. So does that elicit you know, research around robotics and mechanization? And so again, another possible opportunity for us in the academic, us in the manufacturing area, to explore new avenues to uh, prevent us being you know, held hostage to some of these issues. So Lenny, with that, I think I'll turn it over to my esteemed colleagues. Uh, as I said, uh, I've identified some of these issues, which you know, Anu and Peter will expand on, given the fact that they are content experts, and I'll be happy to answer some of those general questions at the end of the webinar. Well, thank you, Dr. Yada, for explaining to us just how far reaching this is and how widespread these challenges are. Uh, we will invite you back again for the Q&A session at the end of this webinar. Mm -hmm. And I have the pleasure now to introduce our second speaker. Uh, Dr. Anubhav Pratap Singh currently holds the BC Ministry of Agriculture Endowed Professorship in Food and Beverage Innovation his research group in the Food, Nutrition and Health Program at the Faculty of Land and Food Systems explores novel technologies for preservation and quality extension of food products. Today, Dr. Singh will discuss the evolving role of innovation and emerging technologies in the food sector, and will discuss the linkages between industry and academia. Dr. Singh, anytime you're ready. Uh, thank you, Lenny. Um, so, uh, First of all, I'd like to thank you uh, for this opportunity uh, to talk about uh, the importance of innovation in uh, securing uh, a food secure future, and which is which is a problem that has become uh, more highlighted and and uh, more intensive uh, given the recent COVID-19 crisis. And now we are back to our drawing boards, trying to uh, think out uh, 
uh, what we have been doing right and uh, where have we have been lacking. Um, so in light of this, uh, I, I, I have put up a, a short deck of slides which, which showcases some of the technologies that we are using uh, with uh, with uh, with BPC-based companies and, and growers, uh, some of which are attractive uh, to the fruits and vegetable processors, while some other are attractive to uh, the plant-based industries. Um, so uh, in order to introduce myself, I, I joined uh, UBC in 2017 uh, uh, as an assistant professor in the, in the field of food processing and immediately uh, I was asked to uh, work on uh, uh, the food and beverage in innovation professorship and setting up the uh, uh, UBC Food and Beverage Innovation Center. Um, so in this role, uh, so for formally the professorship was endowed in the year 2019 and in this role I had been uh, uh, working uh, with the academia, with, in this, in, with the industry and also with the government uh, uh, in order to make sure that uh, uh, like we have sufficient innovation capabilities within the province and and what kind of facilities we can provide to the entrepreneurs and the innovators and the funders uh, uh, so that uh, the technology development remains within the province and within Canada and which is a very very important aspect nowadays uh, uh, in, in light of the COVID-19 crisis which is asking us to become more and more uh, uh, resilient uh, which is asking us to uh, reduce uh, dependence uh, on our uh, partners uh, around the globe uh, 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 primarily because uh, uh, we have seen that uh, we have to fend for ourselves uh, in order to be sustainable and uh, uh, which, which is a, a driving uh, force for the R&D innovation uh, uh, mandate which was given by the uh, uh, Ministry of Agriculture uh, um, in, in 2017. Uh, so the objectives of this uh, professorship is basically to liaise with the ministry in establishing a BC Food Hub network. And this Food Hub network consists of various processing facilities across the province, uh, are focusing on value-added innovation and uh, processing capabilities in different remote regions of the province and, uh, and connecting all of them together uh, through uh, a network known as the BC Food Hub Network, with UBC uh, serving as the scientific uh, center, uh, as the scientific epicenter uh, of of the entire uh, uh, Food Hub Network, wherein uh, we are providing R and D services uh, uh, to various industries and uh, and various uh, uh, profit and non-profit uh, organizations. Um, so, uh, in 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 light of this, uh, I have been exploring various uh, areas such as alternative protein processing, novel non technologies, valorization of food industry ways to make it more sustainable, encapsulation of bioactive compounds uh, for food fortification in order to solve uh, the problem of malnutrition in nutritionally challenged communities in developing countries and also in developed countries. So I will be showcasing some of the, our successes. Uh, um, so the major activities of the uh, professorship has been around uh, research activities on non-thermal processing technologies, wherein we collaborate with India, with Poland, with Mexico on various non-thermal processing technologies like high pressure, pulse electric field, pulse light. So these non-thermal processing technologies are an approach by which we can ensure sustainability without, uh, uh, without heating the food unnecessarily or uh, without adding any contaminants or additives uh, in, in, inside the food product in order to preserve them. We can just preserve them using physical preservation approaches, which is also a step in the, in the direction of sustainability and also uh, uh, in the, the direction of uh, making sure that we, we are able to provide a high quality and nutritious food uh, to all the masses. Um, um, the second aspect is about the noble encapsulation and fortification technologies we be, wherein we basically uh, use the surplus uh, ingredients or we use uh, the, the, in the, food, the food industry waste. We extract the noble compounds out of them. Uh, uh, we have also been working with the indigenous garden initiative wherein we are working with some indigenous plant species and we ex extract out the noble uh, bioactive components and then encapsulate them into some kind of a nutraceutical uh, product uh, which can be marketed. Uh, so, so this again enhances the sustainability and then we are also uh, working on various plant-based sustainability research uh, in collaboration with Mexico and Poland. Uh, apart from that, uh, I have been in, in involved with fee for service and consultancy services to food, local food industries. Uh, wherein our uh, our UBC uh, lab is is offering these kind of uh, uh, services. Wherein if, if 
if a producer wants to use some of our pilot scale equipment, they can come to us and, 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 and we can provide those. This becomes very, very important for R&D innovation because uh, most of the food industry is basically small scale. And many a times the, 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 the industry people, they, they might or might not have access to the, um, to the cutting edge technologies and having those uh, things at UBC, uh, we can uh, support innovation and uh, also support training of future generation of, of students in this direction. Apart from that, I've also been involved with teaching um, uh, regular food process science, advanced food process science and food engineering courses. Um, uh, uh, something to mention is that we have started a, a new international summer course uh, in collaboration with ITESM uh, in Mexico. So that is a Canada-Mexico course wherein the students have the opportunity to, 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 uh, to study the food processing infrastructure in Mexico and in Canada, compare them and understand that what are the challenges that are there in both developed and developing countries. Uh, some of the successes that we have uh, had uh, recently, uh, it is uh, like, uh, uh, one of the technologies which is which is uh, uh, not new to UBC. Uh, uh, UBC has already uh, been one of the founders of, of of this technology, which was later commercialized uh, into a, a Vancouver-based company, Enwave. And so this technology is vacuum microwave dehydration technology. And we are now using this technology uh, in collaboration with Daya Foods, which are plant-based protein ingredients. Uh, uh, company and, and the problem with plant-based food again it, it is very very good and it, it it is economical it improves sustainability the problem is is, is the protein over there and uh, uh, the biggest problem is that protein sources from uh, from from plant-based food they have some kind of off flavor in them so we have been using this novel technology vacuum microwave dehydration in order to remove those off flavors uh, uh, and then incorporate these uh, uh, proteins with a bland profile into a uh, non-dairy uh, uh, products. Uh, um, so, so, so this is again kind of innovation uh, solving some of the uh, uh, current problems uh, uh, in the industry. And P is uh, and P is a very very important product for for Canada. Another very important product for uh, for 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 British Columbia is blueberries, and we have been working with the BC Blueberry Council. Uh, uh, me, myself, and, and Dr. Castellarin's group, uh, and we have been uh, ex uh, uh, like looking into various technologies for extending the post-harvest quality of PPC blueberry blueberries. Uh, wherein our target is to basically uh, expand the uh, around six weeks of marketing of um, the supply chain to eight to twelve weeks. Uh, um, so we are looking at novel active packaging and, and novel post post-harvest processing techniques in order to package and preserve uh, blueberries so that they, they, they last longer. And this is all on fresh uh, blueberries. We have other uh, projects in mind that are uh, going on with frozen blueberries and with high pressure of blueberries are also going on. But, uh, um, but uh, here we, we, we are just focusing on the uh, packaging and, and mobile uh, processing. Another sustainability related study that we had recently done was with the uh, breweries, uh, wherein uh, we have we were working with a company known as Craft Grain, uh, 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 who basically aggregate the previous spent grain. So this previous spent grain is basically the grain that which is left after fermentation. And so this is the food industry waste. Most of that goes to either landfill or as a very, very cheap cattle fodder uh, uh, for, for, for feedstock. And so here, what we were doing is we were taking this uh, um, uh, this uh, waste from the uh, from the brewery industry and dehydrating them, pasteurizing them, and then converting them into ingredients uh, which can be used in food products. So instead of recycling, we are calling it upcycling of of food products, uh, which is again a sustainability uh, driven um, pr pr project, and uh, it has huge implications for the brewery industry because uh, now they can uh, you know come up with new products from something which was basically a waste for them. And also these products are very healthy because they are very rich in fiber and also very nutritious. So we are basically, uh, um, you know, getting more bangs for the dollar uh, for, 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 from, from the same amount of grain. We are getting more nutritious products and we are able to evolve our economy. Another, uh, still, still stick, sticking to the beer. So this is an important uh, 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 project that was recently published. Uh, and uh, so this is in collaboration with Mexico and Australia. 
uh, and uh, uh, here our multi uh, in, our international team basically looked at uh, beer and how the consumers respond uh, uh, to the like how the consumers feel on drinking beer wherein uh, we basically track their facial movements and using biometrics and and advanced digital technologies we basically combine the sensory and the digital together and we could uh, we could see even those measurements on the faces of the people for example uh, sometimes when you feel it you can become become disgusted with the first taste and then you become surprised and so all those you know uh, uh, rapidly uh, changing emotions we could track that and we did it for various kinds of beer so 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 this is something innovative and uh, something that can be looked at where, wherein we are using advanced food innovation in order to understand consumer interactions and and consumer liking about the product uh, another uh, research area that we are working with uh, in collaboration with dr k our associate dean research uh, is uh, based on uh, basically um, um, using antioxidants and plant-based extracts in order to extend the shelf life and in order to slow down uh, the, the lipid uh, peroxidation in hemp seed oil and other uh, oil-based products including soybean oil also we have uh, we have looked at and we are also looking at other oils at the moment uh, so part of this project is also funded by a local uh, 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 foods, uh, a local uh, uh, company, Ascension Sciences. So again, we are working with them, making sure that uh, uh, they can extend the uh, uh, shelf life of hemp seed oil. Um, now, since we are talking about COVID, so I am I have also put in something related to pulsed UV light, which is very very interesting right now for the food industry, which is trying to uh, uh, you know um, uh, decontaminate their their their, their places. So we, in in this regard, we are working with a Mississauga-based company, Solaris, uh, who who produce pulsed UV light robots. So again, talking about robots, since Dr. Kitts mentioned about them, so this is again very pertinent. Where wherein we we are having robots that can go into the room. Uh, or into the processing area and basically uh, uh, fill the area with pulsed UV light. So this light can decontaminate. So this is just like UV, but more concentrated. And as opposed to UV, which might take 15 to 30 minutes, uh, this can decontaminate the, the room uh, within like 15 to 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. So this has huge implications. Uh, if I'm not wrong, in London right now, they are using this technology in, in, in ambulances because in ambulances between two trips, you have to decontaminate them and you have to reduce the time. So, so something again, which is very, very important for the food industry. Uh, we have been working over this for the last two or three years, wherein we are uh, trying to uh, uh, develop this technology for, for liquid-based products. And, and that's why we are coming up with spiral chambers and stuff. Uh, but, but overall, this technology has a lot of potential for, for solving, for, 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 for mitigating some of the challenges in the current COVID-19 crisis. Um, and the last technology that I would like to focus on, although we do not have a lot of research, but we do have some uh, some publications uh, based on the review of these. And and earlier I used to work on high pressure a lot in in my supervisor, Dr. Ramaswamy's lab in in. Uh, in, in McGill University, Dr. Ramaswamy is also an alumni of UBC. So something again, which is related to our faculty and, and, and the proud moment. So Dr. Ramaswamy is an expert in high pressure and he has lots of high pressure. He has been, he's basically one of the pioneers in this field. And high pressure is a technology by which we can decontaminate and inactivate viruses uh, 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 very easily just by applying pressure without any temperature so so uh, so you know the, uh, right now there's a huge concern about the fruit, fresh fruits and vegetables and for that and possible contamination given their short uh, market life and so so there is a chance that viruses can survive on the surface the surface although that is very very low so a, a huge amount of argument over that amongst food experts but but plainly speaking there might be a chance and and so people are look, looking for some kind of intervention and high pressure offers the perfect intervention wherein you basically expose the food to around uh, 5,000 to 10,000 times the atmospheric pressure and that basically kills, not kills, but inactivates the virus. Uh, so something of very important and we are also getting this uh, using, uh, uh, using CFI, using money from the Canadian Foundation for Innovation very soon at UBC as well. So in order to sum it all up, uh, we are looking at various technologies and this is the main uh, uh, theme behind the proposed UBC Food and Innovation.
operation center where, where, where we are going to bring in all these technologies uh, um, like advanced thermal preservation, high pressure preservation, advanced dehydration technologies, extraction technologies, and advanced fermentation technologies in order to harness the potential of our of our products that are grown in BC and in Canada, and other, in, in order to make sure that none of them is wasted. Right now, uh, they say that 30 to 40 percent of, of the food products are wasted. In order to make, make sure that that waste is minimized, because uh, people say that we do have enough food. Uh, the only problem is that we do not have uh, enough, uh, like a good food resilient system uh, in all parts of the world, which is the which is the big problem. So, uh, with that, I would like to sum up and. If you have any questions, I will be uh, happy to take it uh, later on. Thank you, Lenny. Over to you. Thank you, Dr. Singh. That was, it's always interesting to see the new technologies developing in food science. Uh, we will ask you to join us again for the question and answer period in just a little bit. And now at this time, I do have the pleasure of introducing our third and final speaker for today. Mr. Peter Dillon currently serves as chairman on the Ocean Spray Board of Directors as chairman, he is an ex officio member of all board committees. Peter has played an active role in many organizations and boards. He was the director for the Vancouver Airport Authority, BC Ferries, where he was also vice chairman, the Canada Customs and Revenue Agency, the Atomic Energy of Canada. He was also on the board of governors of Simon Fraser University, the audit committee for the Vancouver 2010 Organizing Committee, the Canadian Olympic Committee, the Vancouver Hospital and the UBC Hospital Foundation where he was a board member. And he was also chair of the Vancouver branch of Right to Play, an international humanitarian organization for children in communities affected by war, poverty, and disease. Mr. Dillon, uh, you may begin when you are ready. Great, thank you. And I'm gonna be talking about farming. Um, hey, so thanks, uh, thanks for having me. Thanks to UBC Farms. And Thanks to uh, Dean Yana for uh, inviting me to join uh, to join you today. And first, let me uh, start off by hoping that everyone is healthy and safe, as Dr. Yana addressed it in unusual times. So I'm going to just uh, over the next few minutes talk about what I see as the future of farming. Farming is always changing. For uh, 10,000 years, we have adopted new technologies and innovations and we face new challenges. But right now is a really interesting and exciting time to work in agriculture. COVID-19 has really highlighted problems that were already emerging in the food system. During this crisis, it became clear that we aren't, that we aren't food secure and that the supply chains are just too long. It's also clear that agriculture labor is a critical issue and that this crisis in our slaughterhouse industry highlights real problems in the meat industry, animal welfare, human welfare, and food safety issues. Here in BC, we often see so-called alternative agriculture pitted against so-called conventional agriculture. The pandemic really highlights why this isn't a good way to think about things. To move forward, we need the short supply chains found in the alternative system, but we need the technology used associated with the conventional systems to move to make sure we can provide food locally year round using indoor growing and long crop season varieties. Neither system really addresses the labor issue in an ethical and a sustainable way. However, that being said, every tech might be a strong part of any future solution. You might wonder why we should worry so much about this pandemic that will hopefully be over soon. Well, the problems that we are seeing likely uh, are minor compared to climate change. There was some news media lately claiming that Canada will be the winner in terms of agriculture in a warming world. But if you look at the academic study being quoted, authors are really clear that expanding our farmland might not work on northern soils. The weather might get more and more erratic and that the Burrell forest is the largest remaining forest ecosystem on earth and we just cannot sacrifice that. I've seen locally in British Columbia in the cranberry sector as the world's uh, temperature, earth temperature has increased 
we were seeing soil degradation in peat soil, and we were seeing a lot of uh, plant dieback. Earlier this, uh, earlier last year, the provincial government uh, government asked myself and two uh, uh, people that I've got to know really well and lots of respect for uh, Lenore Newman and uh, Arvind Gupta uh, to uh, lead a food security task force. And as we looked at uh, our mandate, uh, it was more focused on finding uh, the opportunities of creating the resilient food system that uh, that society could rely on. And we looked at areas of climate change, population growth, cleaner food, were some of the underpinnings of, uh, of the report we came up with. But one in particular area that I just really jumped out to me was the food waste in our current system. We interviewed a cherry producer who dumps a large portion of his crop as there is no way economically to sell it. The amount of food waste that occurs every year in North America is just outstandingly high. And uh, we need to figure out ways on which we can put supply and demand in some sort of balance because the inputs that are being put into growing those crops and then having those crops dis destroyed actually really does hurt our environment. I really feel that uh, BC should and could lead as our products that we grow are excellent uh, and should not be thrown away. It's just simply wrong. The task force re recommended that the province work towards the UN's 2030 goal of cutting food waste in half. Technology can help us develop new products and new markets for excellent fruits and vegetables grown in BC. One area that I'm particularly passionate about is feeding more people as our population grows. I think BC will see a real diverse sector from conventional production to mixed farms, value-added processing, and also a rapidly expanding indoor agri-industrial sector. We are a great place for this as we have limited land, but lots of energy, talented people, and good water. I want to share a story with you. Last year, I was in New York at uh, a Ag Tech Summit, uh, and it was during um, the UN Week, which I recommend uh, anyone listening never go to New York during uh, UN Week. Uh, but it was a room of 350 young people and they were all there learning about ag tech and participating in the, the conversations that were happening. And I leaned into one of the people that were next to me and asked, what do you do? And they said, well, we, we grow food. I said, oh, well, where's your farm? Uh, they said, just you know, a few blocks away from here, we have a bunch of containers and we grow food in there. And the big aha moment for me is when I walked away was that as we see young people leaving farms uh, in the traditional sense, I saw young people re-engaging in growing food. They just redefine what a farmer is and what a farm looks like. And that was very exciting and inspiring for me. And we need to be a part of this revolution. Singapore has no farmland to speak of and it wants to produce 50% of food domestically. That, that's a huge opportunity and we need to be in it. Now, this next thing I wanna say might be a bit controversial, but I believe that we should really examine how much meat we eat. Globally, 70% of all agricultural land is used to produce meat. Is that way too much? As we speak, the Amazon is being cleared to produce beef for us. In the work of the task force, it became clear that Canada can be a plant protein superpower. Pea protein, sunflower protein, even sea vegetable protein. It's a great opportunity. For 50 years, we worked to make meat really cheap. Human and animal health has suffered though. And animal ethics and labor ethics of the industry are just not acceptable today. I really feel that there is a lot of potential 
in the emerging plant protein sector, which you heard earlier about. More importantly, I think consumers are starting to tell us that they want these alternatives. Agritech is uh, more than just about greenhouses. Field-based agriculture is changing really quickly. Everything from autonomous tractors to precision drones that help reduce the use of chemicals by targeting pests and illness at the really early stages. In the future, we will use data to farm with precision using fewer fossil fuels and chemicals, and Agritech will help all farmers, full-time and part-time, for the largest to the smallest, uh, from grain and cattle farmers to agritourism operators. So in closing, I think farming is pretty amazing. 10,000 years ago, we started domesticating plants and animals. We learned to crossbreed crops to make newer varieties. We learned to let fields go fallow and use cover crops. We noticed bird droppings uh, increase yields and it ended up mining gilm around the world. We replaced draft animals with machines and improved our plant and animal breeding. Though we need to move past fossil fuels, they'd still deliver fertilizer, which remember feeds billions of people. Now we are able to look at genetics and precision agriculture, and also at cellular agriculture. But as a farmer, I can tell you that uh, I'm very excited about the future. I've been farming in British Columbia for 41 years, and prior to that as a child, uh, I was farming with my family in California, with peaches and prunes. But I can, I can look out and I think the future is very exciting. Uh, and I think ag tech is gonna be playing a big part in that future. That's it, thank you. Thank you very much, Peter, for those powerful and insightful words. And thank you again to all of our speakers today. So we do have quite some time left and I do see a lot of questions in the Q&A box. I see our other speakers have joined us already. So thank you to all who submitted your questions or upvoted them. Uh, we'll try to get through as many as we can. So I will begin by reading the, the most highest rated question. So that reads, how would new food innovation technologies affect small scale local family farms? If what we need for food security is a more localized food system, how does, that, how does innovation play a role in that? And I'll pose that to all three of you. I'll, I'll take the first step at that. I, I think when we look at food security uh, and uh, in all farming, not just small, but all farming, we've got to start thinking about growing food, not one or two months of the year. We, got, we need to start growing food 12 months of the year. So we're less reliant on, as Dr. Yada said, on food coming from other countries, other areas that we should be able to grow locally. And uh, I think that's a huge opportunity. I think it's uh, environmentally correct. It, uh, it, it's less reliant on others. Uh, and I think there is an opportunity as we look forward to have that happen. And, I'll, and, I'll, and also, um, I think technology helps the part-time farmer, the small-time farmer on precision farming. Uh, it, uh, it will help uh, in, in many, many ways. Uh, and, it, it help, and it helps everyone, not just the big farmers or the big producers. Yeah, I think supplemental to that, Lenny, um, I think what COVID has really identified is the importance of food preservation technologies. And, and Anu can talk about this uh, because, you know, I think back to my grandmother's time and my mother's time where, you know, the way you extended the availability of a certain crop was through canning. Um, and that was wonderful, you know, uh, the quality sometimes suffered uh, from that of a fresh product, but you know, the technologies that Anu is looking at, which are non-thermal, you know, afford the consumer a safe product with probably more fresh-like qualities. And so for the small farmer or even a large-scale farmer, these are gonna be wonderful technologies to actually extend the shelf life or availability of local commodities. So I think there's, as Peter was saying, you know, we need to really rely more on what we grow locally. 
whether that be through extension of a growing season or some technology. Also, uh, I would like to add a um, little bit more on, on the technology side and, and also on the small scale local family farms. So uh, in, in, in my opinion, one of the biggest problems, and I originate from India, so a lot, a, a big part of that experience also comes from India where there are actually very, very small farms and, and local small family farms are, are more in common and people buy local and, uh, uh, but the biggest problem is the, volat the, the vol volatility that comes each and every year with these farms. For example, sometimes like one year, they will have lots of produce and probably no buyers. Whereas the next year, there might be a, uh, an environmental impact or a climatic condition because of which uh, the, the produce might be low. So, so each and every time uh, uh, they have to adapt and uh, they have to adapt very quickly. Uh, if if we encourage food innovation and bring that innovation uh, to them locally, uh, for example, someone in Kelowna might have access to it in Kelowna, whereas someone at, uh, in uh, 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 North Vancouver might have it in, in North Vancouver. Uh, in, in, in that case, what we are solving is that we are, we are solving this problem of volatility. We can, uh, we can ask, uh, like uh, the local farmers will have these technologies, these dryers, for example, someone is producing blueberry and has a small local farm and, and this year they have an excess uh, and they're not getting the same money uh, that they might be expecting is, is, is a fair exchange for that. In that case, they can uh, go back and go back to these processing technologies and have their own, uh, you know, innovative product come out into the market. So, so, so this is how mm -hmm. we can make it more localized, and and that, that is a very very important plan, uh, like role that that innovation uh, is going to play in in securing. Uh, um, this food security in in near future. And that also circles back to um, some of the, the resiliency of our food system that was talked about earlier today. So the second question is, uh, it relates back to the agriculture uh, sector, and it reads, how will food innovation affect the agricultural labor sector? Won't there be a large amount of job losses if we move towards a more technology focused agricultural mode? Um, concerns. Sure, I can. I can. I mean, it sounds like a Ricky out of question to me, but I'll uh, I'll take first, uh, first uh, shot at this. Uh, yeah, you know, you know. First, let let's be honest. Um, a lot of the workers uh, in the ag sector are foreign workers that are brought in on a temporary basis annually, and uh, we rely heavily on that workforce. Also, uh, it's um, uh, no surprise, and I'm sure many of the Listeners have heard uh, that uh, in in some places uh, in Ontario, they talked about shutting down all farms because these workers that came were actually coming with the virus, and uh, and caused a real issue um, in Ontario and other regions. And in British Columbia, we faced the same thing. So, um, frankly, we if we didn't have the foreign worker program, we have very few people. Uh, in agriculture today, and that's just the truth of it. Where technology actually, I think, helps us is it pivots us from the existing um, labor market that we have today, the reliance that we have today. Kind of think about this. Kind of think about young British Columbians, instead of working in a field doing things, they're working in a room, pressing buttons as food is brought and heart being harvested. So technology, um, actually, uh, I think the opportunity is creating new jobs, harvesting food, growing food differently. And, you know, um, well-paying jobs as well. These are going to be meaningful jobs into the future. So, um, and, and, I, and, and back to my New York example. That's where I saw the excitement of young people re-engaging in growing food. Um, and, and I think that's kind of um, a really interesting uh, path to you know, kind of investigate. Yeah, Lenny, I think, you know, again, supplemental to Peter's comments, you know, I think COVID has really given us an opportunity to redefine agriculture. 
Um, I think, you know, for many people, agriculture is still thought of as traditional agriculture, um, you know, tractors, uh, etc. As Peter has indicated, you know, and if you get to read John Stackhouse's report from the yeah. World Bank 4.0, he talks about how the new agriculture will involve a lot of technology and it uh, will attract young people. You know, to be honest, at universities, you know, what drives universities are student enrollment and you know, we're all competing uh, to get the best students. And especially in Vancouver, in an urban environment, um, I think if we attempt to redefine agriculture as, yes, it does still have this core root of agronomy um, and the various disciplines related to agriculture, but now embraces the technologies of whether that be, you know, uh, electrical engineering for sensor technologies or artificial intelligence with regards to what do we do with the data that we get from these. It's all about actually increasing efficiencies too, you know, as we have with robotic milkers. Um, we're in the um, process of looking at a robotic milker for our UBC dairy. And uh, I understand from the farm manager that the yield that we'll get from a cow for the milk will be vastly increased through um, robotic milking. And that's not to take away from the labor issues. You know, I think there's a humanity issue with regards to being able to uh, have uh, workers on the farm. But maybe what will happen in the future that those uh, workers won't be actually in the field. They'll be, as Peter said, at a control panel helping us with that harvest, helping us with the planting. Yeah, and I will dare to add on top of Peter and Ricky, and I really dare when I say this, but uh, I think we have migrant workers, which is not a very good thing in my opinion, I, and I will rather have those migrant workers become permanently settled in, in Canada or have a longer term employment in Canada. And that would also have not created this problem. Like if we have jobs for them for year round, that would also not have created this problem of migrant laborers not be able to come back into Canada or, and, and stuff. So, uh, so technology will, will probably move us in that direction where we will be able to uh, you know, uh, uh, have some activities all around the uh, year, uh, both in winter and in summer months. Uh, wherein we will be able to uh, provide more stable job or job opportunities for them thanks to technology uh, in future. So, uh, so saying that it will um, uh, reduce uh, the jobs in the sector is also. Uh, um, uh, I will not say that it is not correct, but I will say that uh, our aim should be to not only uh, increase the job but also to put more money in the pocket of those laborers and. Uh, and that is only possible if we have a better economy and better technological inter interventions uh, in order to smoothen the whole process and make it more sustainable, both environmentally and economically. Thank you for all your answers. I think we have time for one more question. And this one is along the same vein as the previous one. And it reads, are there opportunities for more co-op type processing systems where farmers can use innovative technologies without having to pay for it individually. So we have five minutes left. If anyone wants to take that question. So I will uh, take that up and uh, like to begin with, I will like to uh, uh, put forward the, the entire uh, concept of the BC Food Hub Network, which is basically based on this, wherein uh, the farmers and, and low-scale growers and processors, they do not have to actually pay for the technology and be able to use it in the regional processing hubs. And uh, so the province of British Columbia is actually working in this direction, wherein they're trying to set up these uh, regional commercial hubs across the province, and they're trying to set up these commercial kitchens, wherein these technologies can be rented, and also the UBC is also setting up this food 
and beverage innovation center wherein uh, farmers and individual processors uh, new young and young entrepreneurs get to test out their technologies uh, get to pilot their products and and also uh, test them in the small market space at UBC. So these are in the pipelines. Uh, uh, but but I think we are moving in that direction where, wherein we want our uh, farmers and our growers and processors to have that access to these technologies locally and without paying for it. Uh, I will let someone add to that. Thank you. Peter, that's been probably a common model that's existed in many agricultural jurisdictions where a number of growers would send their commodity to a central facility um, for even something as simple as sorting. Um, and so that each individual farmer doesn't bear the responsibility for carrying the capital cost of equipment and it's shared. Would that be the case with yeah. uh, cram cram yeah, no. yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, most uh, most cranberry guys, um, because of the volume, need to have yeah. uh, their own independent. But no, there, there's there's sharing, there's co-oping of equipment. Uh, certainly done in, uh, with uh, many of my peers, uh, and just an efficient way of um, of, of, of growing and farming. Thank you. All right. Well, with four minutes left, I do see quite a bit of questions left, but I don't think we have time to get to them. So I think I will commence with the wrap up. So once again, I would like to thank all of our speakers. Oh, but before that, uh, we will try to continue this dialogue. So more information about how this dialogue will continue will be sent to all of our audience members in a follow up email after the session. So stay tuned for that. And now I would like to thank our wonderful presenters again. So Dr. Ricky Yada, uh, Dr. Anubha Pratap Singh, and Mr. Peter Dillon. Behind the scenes, we would also like to thank Melanie Kuxdorf, Jessica Lattice, Mare Norton, and Michael Salome. And we hope you will join us in two weeks time for the next episode uh, entitled Essential Labor, Essential Lives, Migrant Agriculture Workers, and COVID-19. That will be happening on Thursday, July 23rd at 3 p.m. And we would also love to hear uh, what you thought about this webinar. You will be immediately directed to a short survey upon exiting this webinar. And we really appreciate your feedback. We want to hear what you thought about that. And please feel free to visit us uh, on our webpage. That's ubcfarm.ubc.ca. Uh, thank you for joining us today. We look forward to continuing the discussion with all of you. And Thank you again to all our speakers today. Thank you, Lenny. Thank you.